Um, but it's it's good for us to tell whoever we're working for. It's like, I'm not going to get paid anything till you get paid. Jeff, episode 36 of the Deal Ranch podcast. So thanks for hosting me in your home here. So Jeff Randolph, founder and president of TRG Communities or the Randolph Group. So we're here in Greenville. You, you've built quite an amazing residential and mixed use development company. You said we were chatting a little bit before somewhere 60 plus projects uh, along your way in, in community development. So really excited to hear your story ins and outs of each of these deals or some of these deals rather uh, in the evolution of the business too. But if you want to give an intro just on yourself and roll at TRG and then we can go back in time a little bit. Okay. I uh, I'm, uh, grew up not far from uh, Greenville and Anderson. I wasn't born in Anderson. Uh, went to Clemson. Uh, was not a distinguished student coming out of um, high school. I think my dad probably thought I'd be back in a year. Yeah. Uh, probably got my footing under me academically while I was at Clemson. I uh, thought I was going to go to law school my entire four years. And my senior year, took a planning class in the College of Architecture, enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Decided that uh, being a lawyer was not really what I wanted to do. And uh, ended up going to uh, graduate school at Clemson in planning studies, which was in the College of Architecture, Mm -hmm. and um, found it, uh, found the private sector side of it uh, uh, attractive, as opposed to, you know, working for the county in the planning office, which I did for a couple of years uh, in Anderson County Mm -hmm. uh, while I was in college. Um, So I think that's helped me. Because I've been on the, the, I can walk into a planning office now and say I've been in on your shoes, mm-hmm. um, and some of the planning principles that I uh, studied I still hold firm to. Um, and in nineteen, I graduated uh, uh, planning studies in eighty three. Kind of made a commitment to not stay in public sector for a long time. Uh, took a job in 84 with Liberty Corporation uh, mm-hmm. here in Greenville. And Liberty had a life insurance business. They had a broadcasting business, generated a significant amount of cash. Um, and the typical life insurance company would have some investment portfolio. Mm-hmm. Liberty had a long history, actually, in the development business. The family, uh, the hip family who founded Liberty, wow. always had an attraction to real estate and development. So they had this development arm. And rather than just being a mortgage lender, which most insurance companies, they just lend the money. Right. We were actually um, developing. So we had a commercial division, office industrial, timber, and residential land. Wow. Uh, I started uh, in both industrial and residential, went to uh, work 100% on the industrial side. And we were doing land development and vertical construction. So we would build 70 to 200,000 square foot industrial buildings uh, and in and in this market as well as up and down I-85, um, which was, I mean, gave me a very good um, understanding. But you're in the industrial world, you're working probably with a more sophisticated client and contractors. Um, As uh, opposed to residential lot development? Yes. Uh, Not necessarily on the engineering side or the contractor side, but definitely... Whoever's leasing or buying. Yeah, Yeah. and you're you're leasing 180,000 square feet to Owens Corning Fiberglass. I mean, those guys know what they're doing. You're selling a lot to a builder who might be... You know, this was 25 years ago. Who's a we call him a pickup truck builder, and his subs are not as sophisticated. It's the subs for a a general contractor building that mm-hmm. type of building. Um, I did not. I, I enjoyed that part of the business, but I was really fascinated with land. You know, mm-hmm. whatever land development. Uh, probably it was a little bit simpler 
Um, you know, I, I, could, I can remember being in meetings on the industrial side. And, I mean, they're talking about stuff that I, you know, had not been around. So I'm depending upon my engineers, my contractors. Got some really good, valuable lessons there. Um, but had the opportunity to take over uh, the residential land operation for Liberty. Mm. That was probably in 87, 88, 89. And at that time, we had two divisions, one that was focused on the Carolinas and one that was focused on everywhere else, Georgia and beyond. Um, those two divisions eventually merged, and I managed uh, that portfolio, which was um, I left Liberty in 97. By the time we had gotten to that point, we were selling three lots a day somewhere from Tennessee to North Carolina to wow. Florida. Um, most of those were larger projects and smaller projects because if you were going to get the Liberty Corp, you know, uh, back office stuff moving, you really didn't want to work on 30 lots. Sure. I mean, it needed to be Substantial. worth it. Yeah. Um, how, how big do you think that portfolio was and how would you measure that? Like just active develop, like <clears throat> uh, we probably had at any one time 25 to 40 active deals. Being um, like 150. Yeah. That, most of them were 125 to 200 lot deals. Um, we were a big developer in Atlanta. Um, selling mostly in those type of markets you're selling to the bigger guys at that time whatever bigger guys was and in most of the other markets uh, we were selling to locals uh, builders so that was kind of our um, bread and butter where we'd go in find six or seven local builders put put them together they'd be, be our builder team and put the lots on the ground uh, when I explain what my business is um you, you find a piece of property, uh, master plan, oversee land planning, engineering, construction, put the infrastructure in the ground, amenities, bring a builder in, he builds a house, he sells a house, he buys another lot. Mm -hmm. That's as simple as it gets. That's right. Um, if he doesn't sell the house, he, he will keep buying some lots, but at some point He's he says, stop. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, when I was with Liberty uh, toward the end, um, it's an insurance company and a New York Stock Exchange company. Um, so they were publicly traded? They were they, yeah. under the Liberty Corp name. What was the significance of being a, having a development arm for the insurance company? Was it just a way of diversifying cash flow or did it, did it help them like... Could, what lines of insurance were they doing at the time? Uh, Liberty Life was primarily a um, term life, whole life. It started in the um, in South Carolina, Georgia, mm -hmm. and you had field offices, you had field agents who actually had a route, and they were going week to week, door to door, you know, knocking on your parents' door. Right. See, they'd sold a hundred thousand dollar policy, and they had to pay. Ten dollars a week for that policy, and you actually had an agent that was going door to door and collecting the ten dollars, ten, fifteen, whatever it <laughs> wow. might be. And um, so again, it, it generated a significant amount of cash. They also had a company called Cosmos Broadcasting, owned more NBC affiliates than anyone else in the country. That generates a bunch of cash. Um, so want to invest that cash, Got it. you can invest it as in mortgage lending, but you're going to get four, five, you know, six, seven percent, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but on the, if you developed, take out that, mm -hmm. instead of lending to the developer, you're the developer, mm -hmm. um, your internal rate of returns, you know, you're getting 14, 15 on a commercial deal, you're getting 20, 22 on a, a residential deal. The issue came in is that to the typical insurance company who is um, overseen by a state insurance board or and national um, typically has four to five percent of their assets in real estate. We had 10. So 
even though it was a good 10, it's still 10. Mm -hmm. So to the regulators and the stock analyst, they're looking in, analyzing the books. Yeah. It's like, we don't like this. Mm -hmm. So for probably three to four years, Liberty kind of moved it around. They put it, moved it out of the insurance company and put it in its own separate. And finally, the regulators and the stock analysts said, you know, we, this, we still have problems. So finally, the leadership at Liberty said, you know what? We're an insurance company and a broadcasting company. Let's just uh, get out of the real estate development business, go back to what they want us to do. I'm oversimplifying it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was easy to sell off the commercial, um, you know, package it up. Right. Somebody pays you up eight cap and you're done. Mm -hmm. Same for the industrial. Industrial had a lot of uh, uh, warehouse and manufacturing facilities, some land. Um, had a timber operation, you know, thousands of acres to sell it. But on the residential business, if you owned a development, uh, like you had a project down in Myrtle Beach, you've got lots on the ground and those lots are worth $30,000. If you're going to sell it off to somebody, he's going to discount the thirty, of course, because it's still worth thirty. So now you got to sell it at where he can 50, make money. fifty yeah. cents on the dollar, forty cents on the dollar, whatever it is. Um, and so the first attempt was to kind of sell that portfolio, and which at that of time just the existing lots, lots that were lots and vacant. Land. Okay, and it was the structure for everything Liberty related. Like they just used their own cash for everything in the deal. Cash. Okay, um, I I tell people I would go up to the fourth floor to the investment committee. I'd present the deal. You know, I need three million dollars, and they would approve it. And it was literally like cut you a check in the Here's office. Your cash. <laughs> so from a difficult part for me to make a transition from that to sure. Randolph is. Bootstrapping it. There's, There's no fourth floor. You know, yeah. Where's the fourth floor? There is no fourth floor. Um, but in trying to sell that portfolio, which at that time was probably a $70 million portfolio, um, 70, 75, it was larger at one point. Um, and you're telling management, my boss is telling management, well, this portfolio is worth $70 million, And you're getting offers at, 50 cents on the dollar. And I'm like, and, it, and I, I was young. I was 28. And I said, I don't, I don't think they're going to take that. But what do I know? Mm -hmm. And um, I made a, uh, they were getting more and more frustrated with the existing leadership. You know, hey, you, you're telling us it's worth this. You're bringing us offers here. So I had a conversation with uh, some other leadership, and I said, you know, he said, how would you do it? I said, well, why don't I just take my staff? And so by that time, everyone else at Liberty had kind of been spun off. You know, we sold off the commercial portfolio. That guy went with it. Um, I said, why don't I just take all my staff who you're pay paying salaries for? I'll just set up my own company, which I had no idea what that meant. Of course. And you can pay me fees. And when I sell a lot, you just have to pay me a 5% fee. And I'll get you out of this portfolio in, you know, five to seven years. Because if you don't buy any more, we'll just plug it off lot by lot. Yeah. And so let's, let's assume we had a neighborhood that had 100 lots and there were 50 on the ground. We'd sell those 50 come to next, it's time to do phase two, which again, old days, I would just start phase two. I would just go back to Liberty at that time and say, okay, we got to do phase two. If you want to sell the dirt, I'll buy it. Uh, or do you want to develop it? If I buy it, I'll pay you fair, fair market for the land. So you're not taking a discount because uh, the dirt's worth whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you want to develop it, just pay me 5%. And sometimes they would do either one. And so we worked Liberty out of that portfolio over five to seven years. While that portfolio was going down, we're bringing, buying our own portfolio. Some of that was 
part of Liberty's deals. You know, it was phase two, phase three, or it could have been a deal that was in production, hadn't even first lot on the ground. And I was like, okay, do you want to keep doing this or I'll just come in and uh, do it myself? Right. Um, but as I said, I didn't have, like my dad didn't have that money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> when, look, yeah, when I'm looking course. behind me, there's no sack of money. Yeah. Um, we were developing a, uh, project up in the, we were in the Greensboro market. It was a really good market for us. I was selling lots to this one, one builder. Hadn't sold a lot of lots to him. He was a builder out of Richmond and, uh, he knew that I was in transition and he said, Hey, I got some guys that I know that I've done some business with up, up in Baltimore and they are strictly equity investors in residential land deals, which there's not a lot of those. Right. You got equity guys that will do commercial mm-hmm. vertical construction, but there's not a lot in the land business. So I called uh, that company up as Chesapeake Capital, uh, which at that time was three three guys. And this was what, 98, this is, 99? This is 97. Mm. I mean, I'm... Year one. 97, 98. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I get in touch with them. And, you know, they were investing with local developers in multiple markets. So they had a guy in Raleigh. They had a guy in Richmond. They had a guy. And I said, well, I want to be your guy in all of South Carolina. You know, it's a small market. So they said, that's fine. It wasn't a formal agreement. But we just started doing uh, deals together. First deal was in Columbia, uh, Ashford. um, That had... um, just barely started under the Liberty name. Um, you know, so we, as in they acquired the land and, and maybe did some utilities? or okay. Yeah, we had maybe done the first phase, but this was this is a neighborhood that probably has 500, 600 homes. So we were early. Right. And uh, some of the amenities, the amenities were on the ground. And we were selling lots to, I forgot who the builder was in the deal. And so... I just replaced Liberty's money with Chesapeake Capital. Yeah. And I'm still doing business with that company. Now there's just one guy. Uh, we've all aged. And uh, they're still our primary equity uh, partner, which is a little bit lazy on my part is that I didn't go out and, you know, start cultivating. Mm-hmm. But it's been a good relationship. So why not? Why not? Um, what was the structure when they came in and swapped out for um, – Liberty. Did you have the same kind of fee deal with them of like, hey, swap out your equity or what, what did the new deal structure look like? Uh, the new that? deal structure would typically be uh, they would bring equity to the table to fund the acquisition. To buy them out. Yep. Or to, or to let, just to Let's buy say it's a them. brand new deal. Okay. Okay. So we go find 100 acres and we need a um, million dollars to buy the dirt and start. Um, they would fund that. They would raise money from uh, high, high net worth right. guys who I never met because I didn't have to, like, I'm a developer. I don't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and then I would go to uh, banking source and get the debt that would fund the infrastructure. Mm-hmm. I was uh, on the, I would be, guarant- I'd be the sole guarantor. Mm-hmm. So they weren't, it, mm-hmm. in the beginning, they were not, guaranteeing i was guaranteeing which you know again but with what collateral uh, not much yeah (laughs) i mean i don't know why in the world the bank the very first deal that we did as a randolph group um was a uh, project called brighton and it's here in greenville 80 some lots it was right next to a deal that we had finished up for liberty um the family that owned that dirt it was two sisters uh, one of them lived on the property. They had watched us develop next door. They called me and said, hey, we'd like to, uh, we'll sell the property. Mom's passed away. Would you like to buy it? Sure. Um, we talked about a price, and I said, well, I, I don't I don't have the cash to pay your price. I said, but what I could do is um, if you'll own or finance it, I'll pay you um, X dollars per lot. I'll, I'll get you out in, there's 85 lots, I'll get you out in 50, plus I'll pay you better interest than you're going to get at the bank on this money. They're very trusting people and said yes. I said, okay. 
Um, <laughs> and we funded that deal, did that 100% ourselves. We didn't have any equity dollars. Um, and then from that, we just built onto it. Um, and we've always tried to, if we can get owner financing somehow or structure a deal, we always try to figure out what the seller needs. And, you know, sometimes the seller just wants cash, get out. Right. But there's an awful lot of times we're doing a new deal, 40 lots, not big, uh, south of town. And it's a brother and a sister. Sister wants to stay in the deal. The brother wants out. He lives in Atlanta. He's a little older. So we structured the, the deal pay the brother off, and then the sister is going to invest uh, in the deal. Very cool. And, and yeah. that helps. I mean, that's just money that we're not having to come out. We don't necessarily have to have it, yeah. but... Helps you, you get know, the deal done. Gets the deal done. Yeah. So. so the structure with Chesapeake in the early days was they would fund the acquisition. You would get the debt with the collateral or cash that you had at the time. And then how did the payout work? How did you split proceeds? Well, one, obviously... You have return of equity through yeah, so them, they, and then also the debt so they side got, too. Um, they got a preferred return. Mm -hmm. Each deal is probably a little bit different. Right. They, they would get a preferred return. I could have got, could get a uh, a return being the guarantor. I would also get fees. How do you um, structure those those fees on a deal? The way we've always structured our fees is we tell our. Um, whoever we're working for. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're not working for anybody but ourselves. Um, or even just to the bank. We don't get paid a fee until we tell, sell a lot. Um, now, because we don't, we have more than one deal, I'm not, I'm living off of that deal mm -hmm. or that deal, mm -hmm. not this one. Right. Uh, so as this one's rolling on, eventually I'll get fees off of this. If anything, I'm postponing those fees, um, playing a little bit of cash flow, games uh, in the business right. um, but it's it's good for us to tell whoever we're working for it's like I'm not going to get paid anything till you get paid right. so if these lots never sell I don't make a dime because they're not worth anything if you don't sell them yeah. so, and I think that's been um, something that has resonated with banks contractors um, equity partners, owners, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, we're in it. You know, we're just not trying to get fat off of fees and hope your deal works. Yeah. So would you have, would it be like a flat fee or a percentage just of, of sales price? Percentage of sales. So depending upon the deal, you know, anywhere from um, 4% to 10%. Got it. Most of the time is probably... Uh, it, Seven percent. If we're paying all, the, if we're writing the checks. So, for instance, if we're, you know, paying the bills, sure, you know, our fees it's gonna be a little bit yeah. higher. If, um, like, there's been deals where Chesapeake now, you know, on a deal, they pay all the bills, and in in some cases, after the downturn, they would get the debt. So, now that transitions a little bit, mm -hmm. but basically, we're still making a fee, and even if it's our deal, where we're an owner, we're yeah. still getting a fee. Got it. Um, and then there would just be a split of proceeds after that. Okay. Based upon ownership, right. based upon your guarantee, their guarantee. After the recession, the whole guarantee world changed. Now it's like everybody's going to be a guarantee. Yeah. And I made the decision after, because I probably at that point of the recession, and the recession that started somewhere in the 07, 08 range and ended in 10, 11, I don't know hit us differently because um, most of my competitors are single market guys. So I'm competing with someone here who has got deals in the upstate, yeah. but they've never developed anything Charleston, in Charleston or yeah. Myrtle Beach mm -hmm. or Nashville. And I think that's uh, typical um, because my a lot of my peers, they want to see it and touch it every single day. Mm -hmm. My Liberty experience, you know, we're stretched from Tampa to Nashville to Greensboro. I can't see it every day. So you really had to align yourself with engineers, architects, contractors, people that you could call, you know, in the morning. And they're going to pick up. Yeah. You know, my the guy that's been doing my 
all my utility work here in Greenville. I was his number two customer when he started his business. I knew that I could call him at six thirty, seven in the morning. He'd pick up. Now, 10 o'clock, he's not going to pick up because he's on his truck. But I could always you know, get him. Uh, the company that does all of our pools, they're based here in Greenville. But they traveled to anywhere we went. And so when I'm talking to that company about a pool, I can talk to them about this pool and that pool. And I know what to expect out of that company. I know that um, because I've learned it from just um, making mistakes is when you build a pool, there's a bunch of connection points because you got a clubhouse and a pool. There's plumbing. Mm -hmm. They got to bring that plumbing out from the building. And then the pool guy is doing plumbing and he's coming to match up. Well, if they don't match up, you know, you got a problem. And so now we can, you know, talk to the contractor and talk to this pool guy and say, okay, how far are you bringing the water out from the clubhouse or the pool building? Ten feet. Are you going to get it? Yes. But I can have that conversation with one guy and about three different locations. Um, so it just uh, makes life a little bit simpler. And uh, But to most of my competitors, that would be complicated, I think. Of course. You know, like, like you've got a project in Monk's Corner right now. There's flooding going on. You can't go see it. So you got to be dependent upon property managers, homeowner managers, builders, contractors. Like, hey, is everything okay? We good? Right. Yeah. Um, what what do you think over time? <clears throat> it may be learned at liberty, but as you obviously in any deal make mistakes and learn from them and carry to the next. What was most valuable kind of traits that you think in, in hiring subcontractors, utility, site work, or even architecture in, in having to like what what is most valuable to you in, in different groups? Like what, what do you look for in a team to um like you're saying feel Comfortable or relying stability in that uh, in that company in that you know that ownership stability as defined by they've been in the same market for or been uh, in business been in the for business some... been in the market and and you know from a let's say just a contractor side you know um, you know if it's my grading contractor um, he's not turning his people so the guy that's grading my next project is the guy that graded that project. So he knows what we expect. Um, depth of organization. Uh, sometimes you'll you'll meet with some companies and they got a really strong leader. But then when you look down, there's nobody behind them, which is okay. But if you had some depth, you know, that their team, you know, whoever's on uh, the second team, if, if the first guy left or the first guy's busy, you still got quality people. Mm. Um, you may have to pay for that. You can always find somebody cheaper to do whatever. Right. And we've never typically used uh, the cheapest guy. Uh, but what we have found is that there's a sense of loyalty. And if there is a problem, I can call those people up and you know, say, hey, I need you to go do something for me. Um, and even though we're not, um, you know, the company here in Greenville that does all of our utility work, we're not their number one client anymore. I mean, there's there's so much work here in Greenville. But if I call them up and say, hey, I got this job, and it's for, for the work that we do for Homes of Hope on the affordable side, they're, most of those are not really big deals. Some of them are, we're getting ready to do nine lots over here. And they're like, Jeff, you want me to mobilize for nine lots? I said, I do. I do. And they will give me, you know, good pricing that's competitive with if it was 100 lots. Mm. Um, we've been loyal to them. They've been loyal to us. Wow. So. Um, In switching gears a little bit, um, it, having done so many different communities, kind of talking about maybe the, the entry point to a deal and, and then evolution of the deal. 
what to you makes a, a good land, like a, a, or a good parcel or a good p- potential development? There's a lot of land, uh, obviously, always on the market. Some has environmental restrictions or zoning restrictions or complexities. But beyond that, just looking at pure location, like what to you, we talked earlier uh, when you said maybe advising someone on maybe don't do that deal. Like what is of interest to you in looking at a new location? And then how does that geography also support that decision as well? Well, I mean, obviously location is important, Mm -hmm. but we've always had a habit of looking um, to where growth will potentially happen Mm -hmm. and always maybe step out further. Um, So the Charleston market, for instance, you know, it's pretty easy. I mean, even 15 years ago, you want to be in Mount Pleasant. But uh, Mount Pleasant starts implementing a um, impact fees, slow in growth, then they had a building permit allocation system that was just driving up cost. I mean, if you got a, if you got one of those things, are you going to build a two hundred fifty thousand dollars house or four hundred? Well, you're going to build four hundred. Right. I mean, that they, I'm not a math guy. Um, so it just was not long term practical. Now, the I think my peers, and then the definition of peers in the land of residential land of isn't. Uh, business mm-hmm. expanded to now include the builders because at least 50% of the product that's being put on the ground today is done by the builders. They either self-develop or they get the dirt, get it entitled, and then they go find somebody who's from Texas, you know, who knows, mm-hmm. bring him in and said, I need you to Hold develop it. this for me, yeah. which arrogantly I say, that guy's not a developer. He's a road paver. Because he didn't name the deal. He's never been in front of city council, county council. He doesn't know land development people in the counties. So uh, it's it's not really his deal. It's the builder's deal. Um, but those guys are not going to take, those developers and those builders are not going to take some of the risk. They're going to still want to be in Mount Pleasant, mm. pay whatever price. We decided back in... 06, 05, 06, 07. We got to get out of Mount Pleasant. And so we head to Monk's Corner, which is out in the middle of nowhere. But but not far from somewhere. Yeah. But but if you looked at it, if you elevated yourself uh-huh. up, you're like, okay, there's the, air, the airport's 20 some minutes away. Um, at that point, there was still you know stuff in and around the naval base. There's jobs on 26, Somerville. Mm -hmm. It's coming this way. I mean, in Charleston, it can't go that way because of the ocean. It's hard to go south. You lose sewer going north. So it's got to come east. Mm -hmm. And so instead of paying land prices in Monk's Corner that might have been, I'm picking a number, 30 an acre at that time, we go out and buy a piece of property that's, 500 acres, 600 acres, or 800 acres. This is Fox Bank? Fox Bank. And paid five, six, or 7,000 acres. Now, we had a bunch of wetlands, and the reason it hadn't, it had gone on the market before, and they walked because of wetlands. Um, what percentage of well, total Well, what we were told at that point, it was like 50% wet. So I go out and walk the piece of property, but I go with a guy from SNME who's down on the coast, um, smart guy. His name was Chuck Oates. And he would be one of these people that he was older than me and people that influenced me, they were older, mm-hmm. wise. He was wise on the, you know, his, what he did for a living. And we walked that site and he said, Jeff, it's got wetlands, but it's not 50%. So you've got 800 acres, 400 acres wet. Um, you've now doubled your price. Ten grand. Yeah. He says, I say, how many acres do you think were wet? And we had a 60-acre lake on it, so take that into account. Mm-hmm. He said, I think you're, 
you're a less than a fourth win, 20%. I was like, really? Why? And, you know, wetlands is either it's um, soil conditions, um, um, vegetation, and then water, you know, the presence of mm -hmm. water. And I remember we were standing in the woods, and he said, look down at your feet, Jeff. And we, and we were looking at a map that somebody else had said that this particular spot was a wetland, like a jurisdictional wetland. He said, look at your feet. And I looked down. He said, what do you see? I said, well, I see a bunch of anthills. He said, <laughs> do you think ants live in a wetland? They can't. They die. He said, this cannot be a wetland because of that. Wow. He said, look at those pine trees right over there. He said, and we were again, that's in the wetland. He said, a pine tree can grow in a wetland, but its uh, trunk is not going to be straight. It's going to be crooked because it's getting too much water. He said, that can't be a wetland. And so we went and he did a wetlands and he had so much credibility with the core that the core... They may have come and visited the site, but when they got that wetland determination from Chuck Oates, mm -hmm. the Corps said, we're good. We know that Chuck Oates is not going to cheat us. He's going to go by the books. He's a smart, credible guy. And so we ended up with, you know, 20% of the wetlands. We only crossed one of them. We only had to fill one. Um, and you asked me what is another criteria for a good development is a good land plan that fits the property. You can have some of the worst land, you know, not attractive. I mean, we've all looked at pretty pieces of property, mm -hmm. but there's also a lot that are just not pretty. Uh, the Korean deal that we'll talk about at some point was not a pretty piece of property. It had scrub pine small oak trees. It just wasn't a pretty piece of property. Probably had been timbered at some point. Topo was, you know, probably had 30 feet of topo across the site. Verdmont. It was an old cow pasture. And I remember telling my clear and grading guy, he said, what? And he hardly read plans. I mean, he said, what, which property am I? And he was looking at one. I said, well, if you're looking at a piece of property that's got trees on it, you're on the wrong wrong piece but it but those two developments with the land plans that were developed for that that we had um i can't draw but i i do think i have pretty good vision mm -hmm. and working with the land planner those are two great land plans executed on those pieces of property um, that transformed them from mediocre pieces of property to great great, great development sites. So what did, in a good land plan as the design or, or defined by um, layout of the neighborhood that's maximizing the existing landscape or, or would I, need yeah. to be done? Yeah. I would think you want to match the land plan to the, to the property, mm -hmm. um, whatever it gives you. As naturally as possible. Rather than trying to have a builder say, well, I need all 50-foot or 60-foot lots, and I need this by this. Mm. And I'm like, well, the property doesn't give us that in this portion. It does over here, but it doesn't here. Um, so we started evolving as a company. And, and when I was at, with Liberty, it was pretty much, you know, I mean, they were all high-quality deals. But it was, for us, fairly cookie-cutter. Um, Liberty couldn't be as creative. They needed 150 lots, 200 lots, put them on the ground, let's go. When I started my own company, I, I shrunk the geographic footprint from the southeast to basically let's stay within four hours of here. It's plenty to do within four hours of Greenville. Um, I didn't want to. I didn't want to drive the rest of my life, and would like to get home. Sure. So, in regards to Picking the parcel, we, we lightly touched on it, but one thing I was curious about, e evaluating new markets and, and sub-markets. So we mentioned a little bit there, and you were just talking about it. You wanted to stay within four hours driving. Well, a lot of things within four hours of here are, are very great, uh, good markets. But in the 90s and early 2000s, it may not 
have been as evident, certainly as it was through COVID or, or through now. But <clears throat> sort if you look at like a Charlotte where you have all these kind of different quarters in um, development markets or sub markets, what to you when you want to bring in like or even a Monk's Corner, 800 acres or you were talking about Verdmont, 200 lots. What gives you the confidence that those lots are going to be absorbed? Is it speaking to local builders? Is it you no? Know, like, what do you? Well, the, how do you evaluate that? First, the market's got to be um, driven by something uh, for growth, and I, I look to jobs. Okay. If a market is job growth driven, then you know manufacturing companies, warehouses, they're coming in, they're hiring. Those people have to have houses. Mm -hmm. More so than just pure government. Like Columbia was an okay market for us, but it wasn't great. It's gotten better now that, you know, I think people have figured out you got multiple interstates. But 15, 20 years ago, it was like, eh, you know, it, in Columbia, people just move around. Right. Not a bunch of people moving in. No. Yeah. Here, you know, we talk about BMW, but before BMW and after BMW, there's just jobs, mm -hmm. you know, coming here or people wanting to retire here. Same for Charleston. Um, you know, Charlotte, North. if you look at North Carolina, um, if you're a builder or a developer, land developer, you're first going to go to Charlotte or you're going to go to Raleigh. Uh, if you go to Raleigh, then you're going to go to Charlotte. Um, then you start knock, notching down to that next level. Um we developed a little bit in Raleigh, nothing in Charlotte, but we did go to Greensboro because there weren't a lot. There wasn't a lot of competition. More local builders or regional guys there, because the national guys are in Raleigh. In those markets, in bigger Charlotte. markets. Mm -hmm. um, one of the markets that we're studying right now, we we really have been, and we we almost pulled the trigger on deal. Uh, Ten years ago, recession kind of got in the way. But you look at uh, the Johnson City, Kingsport, Bristol market. Yeah. Well, if you're gonna if you're gonna go to Tennessee, you're gonna go to Nashville first. Then you're gonna go to Memphis, or you're gonna go to Memphis and Nashville. Then you're gonna go to Chattanooga. You might go to Knoxville, but by the time you start thinking about Knoxville and Kingsport, you're just worn out. And then, then you look at it, it's like, well, the numbers just aren't really there. But we we can go into a market like that or even a market like when we went to Monk's Corner or even a sub-market of Greenville and put a really good product on the ground. And because of the way we develop with multiple products in the neighborhood, we don't have to get 40 or 50 sales in this one price range so the typical person that I'm competing with you got 200 lots they're all going to be 50 foot lots 60 foot lots and they're going to hit one price band because the builder that he's developing for wants that mm -hmm. I need I need 200 lots for this product I'll put them on the ground well in a market like Greenville or the upstate you're only going to sell so many because it's not that big right you know, a big deal might, or a deal now might sell in one price range, in one band, 35 lots. Uh, or, and, and that's in a, a good year. You know, you end mm -hmm. up selling 20. The model home agent, they're not happy. Right. Builder's not happy. So then you start maybe doing dumb stuff. You start cutting price, cutting quality. Mm -hmm. What well, we started doing and it started to evolve when we first did Redfern and then went to Verdmont, Carillion, O'Neill, uh, and Foxbank, particularly at O'Neill. Um, we would get several builders and say, okay, in this neighborhood, in this phase, we're going to have 50 lots, but we're going to have a rear-loaded product we're going to have a front-loaded product, and we're going to have townhomes. So now that builder could build all three products, one model. So he gets 25 of this, 20 of this, sells 10 townhomes. He's selling 50. Right. 
and uh, at O'Neill, you're selling a townhome. Originally, we're in the hundred and below two hundred, but you had a single family house that was pushing three hundred. So now the band the yeah. band is wider, and if you can get the buyer to the site, you got a better chance of selling because if that buyer comes in and says, "Well, I can only spend two twenty five and I really would like a townhome it's got to go yep um, I remembered um you know if you build every single house with a attached garage, if the guy that just wants a detached garage wants it, you can't sell you can't to him. Buy him yeah so you've lost him um and so we started mixing product on the street. So I can take you to O'Neill Village on one street. We have a duplex, front-loaded, rear-loaded, and townhomes all on this one street. Wow. And, you know, and now at O'Neill, we have townhomes that are in the 225 without a garage, maybe 250 with a garage. And down the street, we have a $700,000 house within walking distance, mm -hmm. which is not typical in most new developments because realtors and buyers, like, I don't want to be, I don't want to live next to the mm -hmm. that house. Sure. You know, and, and at O'Neill, I can remember we built our first townhomes or the builder built it. And I can remember a homeowner saying, well, I don't, I don't want that townhome in my neighborhood. Why? Well, it's going to hurt my values. I was like, not really. I said, your house is a 2,000 square foot house and I know what you just paid for it and you paid, making this up, 120 a foot. Townhome is 1,200 and his price per square foot is higher than yours. No so you're actually hurting him. <laughs> and when you just talk to people and say, okay, let's let's think about, do you want to live in a neighborhood that every single person looks exactly like you? They're all 40-year-olds with two kids. Yeah. But I said, to me, the healthier neighborhood has a 70-year-old, a 40-year-old with older kids, 50-year-old, and then some young couples. That's the healthiest neighborhood. If you think about any place, Greenville, Columbia, Charlotte, where you think about what are the best neighborhoods, old neighborhoods. Mm. They have a mixture of product and a mixture of a, a diversity yeah. of people. And I think that's, um, you know, that that's a good um, foundational tool for what we do. But it also makes economic sense because now I'm enticing that builder to hey, just build multiple products, one agent, one model, mm. and you can actually make more money here than you're going to make down there. And right. I believe that your house, if you build the same house, because in Greenville or any of the markets we're in, they're building the same house. You know, it's the yeah. Mont, it's the Montford. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, well, we're telling the builder that if you build this model in our neighborhood with amenities, lifestyle, streetscape. We're adding value to your house, so it should sell quicker and for more money than this one over here. Yeah. That should be enticing no doubt. to that builder. It's fascinating. Well, one question I wanted to ask earlier on, and this brings into the build component as well, but what, what part of developing a neighborhood is the most challenging part of the cycle? So kind of breaking it down, we have, well, there are a lot of different components, but you you from acquisition, permitting, uh, we master plan, but then on this uh, actual execution side, we have uh, the site work, utilities, and then we have bringing in different builders. We have construction. You're overseeing, may maybe have a overseeing part of making sure people are staying true to the architectural guidelines, and then at the end of the day, making sure everything sells too, or at least <clears throat> it's critical to you. W what part of the traditional neighborhood development is most challenging in that cycle? Um, I would say that... Most critical, maybe. I would say what most critical is executing the plan. So that does get to the details okay. of the construction, 
getting the builders to adhere to the architecture, which for the most part they do, but the little details get Matter. dropped. You know, houses, they, they start building, they start making mistakes. You you miss it. Um, so it's challenging a, would be the next Challenging yeah. is, acquisitions is probably the same challenge. It's just trying to find dirt. Mm -hmm. It's not like I need, I've got a small company, so it's not like I need 20 parcels every year. Um, and we probably get enough looks from people that call us that are working with a family or you got a family that's calling us. And, and that happens a lot that, uh, like the Pine Stone development up in Travis Rest we're doing. Um, that was a family that, um, liked real estate, but didn't have much development experience and said, Hey, we want to develop this. We don't know what it's necessarily going to look like. Um, but can you come in here and develop it for us for fee? How, how'd they find you guys? Did you do a project nearby? Um, I knew uh, their, I'll call him their, his CFO, uh, worked for a uh, CPA firm here in Greenville, and I knew him from there. Didn't really, I mean, we stayed in touch, but I didn't know him that well, and didn't know that he had gone to work for this company. And then he just comes into the office one day, you know, called up and said, told me what they wanted to do. And he said, we've checked references. We've asked a bunch of people, you know, who should we get to be our development partner? And your name was always on it. Said, Great. And we're doing now our third deal for that family, getting ready to. Wow. Uh, so I think acquisitions is about the same. I think the permitting and designing, the designing and the permitting process has gotten way more complicated on the design side, getting it a, getting it approved, even if it's zoning, that's complicated because most people um, they don't want anything, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I've said, if you want to stop growth, you here in Greenville County, you got to stop attracting industry. But you don't want to. You don't really want to stop attracting industry because that's paying your taxes, right? Because that's keeping your homeowner taxes down. So you, Mr. Homeowner, who's moved down here from wherever because of taxes, then you got to shut this down. Right. right. And they're not, they can't do that. Um, but I, so let's assume you find a piece and you can get it zoned. So now you're just into design and permitting. Mm -hmm. It's challenging on the design side because um, the engineers that you're asking, um, mm -hmm. They don't have the depth of experience, and they significantly rely on technology to design. I was talking to one of my engineers, who's a really smart guy, and he designed a neighborhood over in Spartanburg, Four Homes of Hope, and never set foot on the piece of property. I'm like, how do you do that? I'm like, you got to walk it. He said, I didn't need to because I had, you know, I got whatever program, whatever yeah. technology. I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> and then, so you get it designed, and then you you uh, turn it in to whoever. And then there's no sense of urgency here. Or now they have a guaranteed sixty days. They take, they send it back with comments. You respond. They got another sixty days. So there's not a lot of. And then when you want to try to put pressure on these people and you go to your engineers and say, hey, we need to, like, have you talked to this guy? Uh -huh. well, I sent him an email. I said, no, I didn't say that. Did you talk to him? And we had a project uh, again over in Spartanburg. And, the, and the, the people in Spartanburg County Engineering, it's a small bunch of people, and they're good guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. And their office is on this side of Greenville. Or on, yeah. It was like 30 minutes away. I was like, can we just go over there and meet with him? And the engineer said, like, drive over there? I'm like, yeah, let's have a meeting with him. I said, I'll drive. So we go over there, sat down with him, went through everything, and and made movement on the permit. But if, you, if they just rely on technology rather than thinking mm -hmm. and talking, getting on the phone, um, getting face to face, um, and then then I think even contractors are relying on technology. 
Um, in, I, in what regard do you think? Um, I mean, land development is not that complicated. Water goes downhill. Sewer goes downhill. Um, you know, it's and that hadn't changed. It hadn't changed in a long time. Probably won't change either. But my my first grading contractor that I worked with here in Greenville, um, a guy named Quincy McConnell. He's from Slater Marietta, country guy. Probably had a high school education. You would meet him on on the job site, and back then the engineer would put or the surveyor would put center line stakes in your road and mark them. You could walk down that road, know what it looked like. You could see the topo going up and down. And on the stake, it would say, cut two, fill three, whatever. So you kind of walk through there. Mm-hmm. Now it's all GPS on the inside the cab. So there's no stakes anywhere. I mean, there's some clearing stakes. Mm-hmm. But as long as he programs it in, he can go out there. Quincy, you would walk out on a job site first day and he'd have the roll of plans from the engineer he'd pull it out he'd throw it in the back of his truck and he would just grade that site get it to where he thought it worked because again here's the road you want your lots ideally to be like this you know yeah a little bit Uh not like this right and i can remember on one job he said well i think i'm finished I'll pull out the plans now. He said, and and I'm looking at it, and they're telling me to cut another two feet here or three feet here. He said, I think it looks pretty good, Jeff. Let's just walk it. Now, people can't do that. You know, you'll go out to a site, and you look, it's like, man, what are we doing here? And the contractor's like, well, I mean, it's just what's on my... It's what it says, yeah. It's it's on my computer. It's it's GPS, and I'm I'm just grading to this plan. You're assuming the plan works. I said, but you're not looking with your eyes. Wow. Um, so just an over reliance in technology, and I know that the, you know, some of the engineers that work for me is like, oh, God, here comes Jeff, <laughs> and he wants those center line stakes in there so he can walk it and see it. It's like it's the only way I know how to do it. Sure. Yeah, things evolve, don't they? That's crazy. Um, you think any negative connotation towards? Obviously, technology in any business or or in most businesses is helping quite a bit. Now, obviously, there's negative components. Do you think that over-reliance on it in your industry slows down projects or leads to any mistakes in any way? I think it leads to mistakes. And it it probably, on the residential side, you go look at some properties and you've got demands from the builder. So, again, if the builders are making the decisions. Right. The builder says, I need a pad that has no more than 18 inches of fall. I need it 50 feet wide. Here, you go out to sites, and it's like, man, they're moving a bunch of dirt out here. And you're you're not working with the land. You're trying to fit the box on it. Mm-hmm. And if if all your boxes look the same, then everything's got to fit it. As opposed to, you know, this portion of the property works better for a rear alley or a narrower product. Well, we don't do that. We don't do that, Jeff. We don't. We don't do that rear loaded product. It's like, well, we're going to do it here. (laughs) Now we we may not do a lot of them, sixty, but we can do a couple, ten. I mean, if if you can't sell ten rear loaded lots in a project that's got 200 doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. You should be able to if you're good enough at sales. Sure. There's got to be enough buyers for that. Yeah. That's interesting. In wrapping up a little bit, is there any project, deal store, or development rather, that comes to mind, highlight over your career or most challenging or most complex? And um, Carillion, we can talk about whichever development you want, but if you want to go through kind of the story of that project um carillion as i said was not a great um physical piece of property it was a piece of property most of it was owned by Furman university that um they, they had bought it for what they thought was going to be um, faculty housing decided to sell it um, and it was put out for kind of rfqs we won it and and we we looked at you know what does the property give us 
We also paid attention to Furman. If you go to Furman campus, you see more brick than non-brick. Mm. You see a lot of water features, fountains, lake, whatever, open space. And by that time, we one of our features in our neighborhood was a lot of passive parks, a big green space, kind mm-hmm. of center lawns. So we wanted to create that. We had 30, 40 feet of fall in the middle. At the top, we put a water feature. Um, top and bottom, you know, um, one was a pavilion. The other one was the bathhouse for the pool, brick. So we tried to pay attention to Furman, um, not copying it, but mm-hmm. at least, you know, Taking what, could, what could we, you know, do that would uh, would pay attention to that and then we ended up with started off with local builders ended up with bigger guys because the recession kind of cut into it i think we sold our first lot in there in 2007 our last one was in 2017 18 um but we executed the plan stayed with the plan even during the downturn where nothing was going on Um, made the transition from local pickup truck builders to some bigger guys, so which is a little bit more complicated. Um, we started executing multiple products in a neighborhood, so we had three different products going. It was all single-family detached. We didn't have any townhomes at that time. wasn't allowed in Greenville uh, in the zoning. Um, but we did have a rear-loaded product, a front-loaded product, um, a smaller house that was more cottage as opposed to a traditional you know, bigger house. Mm -hmm. So we started executing that philosophy. Uh, The downturn was, you know, very difficult. um, Did all home sales stop in the neighborhood? Zero. Yeah, zero. I mean... For how long, do you think? We didn't sell one lot in Greenville for three years. Now, we were selling lots elsewhere. Thank goodness. We were selling lots in Charleston. Now, Charleston had had gone downhill before. So all all my peers here, they were doing pretty good. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm hurt because yeah. we're not selling anything in Charleston. But I was selling some stuff here. Well, then Charleston starts coming back, and Charleston and Greenville goes down to zero. I mean, there was no no one's building, no one's lending. There's just nothing. But you just have to stick to the plan. So O'Neill had just started. Thought we had a really good land plan. Mediocre piece of property again. Uh, out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you you turn off away at Hampton Boulevard and make a left, you're going to pass more cows than anything. Right. And we got 12 houses on the ground around the Central Park, and it shuts down. Um, but we really started then executing that when the market did come back, um, mixing the product in the neighborhood. So you can't, we couldn't put, because capital was tight Mm -hmm. so like okay how can we get 50 lots on the ground and hit multiple products so we really started executing on mixing the product on the street so let's we had a we had a big park in the middle of the neighborhood that was going to have a road at the bottom Mm -hmm. we convinced Greer to get rid of the road because we had an alley so now and we said instead of single family houses off of an alley let's go to townhomes um, you know, 10 town homes. The builder said, Jeff, there's not a town home on this side of Wade Hampton Boulevard. Where's the market? And I said, I don't know where the market is, but I can't imagine we can't sell 10. Um, and we had a detached garage. And what did that do for you, those 10? Just get a new well, product in the I mean, market to sell something? Because if I, if I tried to do 10 single point. family houses, I can only sell 10. So by the time he's got to work through these 10 before he can get to here, right. I could sell those 10 for single family detached, mm-hmm. I could sell these 10, so I got 20 sales. Yeah. Plus I got 20 buyers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but the builder was pushing back. He's like, I don't know. I don't think there's a market out here. I believe there is. So you have to kind of, there's tension there. Okay, we'll do it. But but Jeff, you want us to build a, I mean, it's a two-story townhome. All the bedrooms are up. And we got a detached garage that's at a level below. So you got to drive in your garage, walk up, go outside, walk up a set of steps, go into the townhome, go up another flight of steps to get your bedroom. Who's your buyer? You think your buyer's got to be a, a family buyer young. 
50% of those first 10 were sold to empty nesters. Really? So what does that tell you? That tell you they're buying lifestyle. They're still active, but they want, they're, they're paying for lifestyle and streetscape and the neighborhood. They're not a square footage buyer. Mm. You know, they're not going to pay you any money for a pool or a dog park or a park. They just want square footage. And that will never be our buyer. I tell tell agents all the time. Well, I lost a buyer to that neighborhood over there. It's like he was never your buyer. Mm-hmm. He was not going to pay for this dog park. And most of our buyers today, they're paying cash, or if they get a mortgage, it's out of necessity. Fifty percent of our buyers are probably fifty and over, active. Some still working, active, uh, or you're you've got somebody that's one or two incomes. I mean, we have plenty of families where two people mm-hmm. are working and getting a mortgage, but they are not buying pure square footage. You know, they're buying the neighborhood. They're buying the neighborhood. So, you know, they, they, they will spend money on the dog park and the pool as opposed to, I call them the uh, king bed buyer. Even if your bedroom can't fit the king bed, if the king bed's cheaper, you go buy it. <laughs> We're not going to sell to those people because they can always find a better deal. Right. We got to go after that person that's willing to pay for some of the lifestyle and amenities that we're going to put in that neighborhood. Wow. Um, Ian, what, what is the status of that project today? So, sold out in seventeen, <clears throat> done. Uh, Carillion. Carillion. Um, yeah. yeah, probably the last whole house probably sold in nineteen, but we're we're done. Okay. Um, you drive through there and still holds up well values are really good um, and um, we still have contact we turn everything over to an association we set them up there from day one we try to make sure that those associations are functioning well when we turn them over well in a leadership as well as financially Interesting. Um, O'Neill went from selling no lots for three years to last year we sold like 120 lots. Oh, wow. Probably the number one volume deal in uh, Greenville uh, County. But again, we're selling townhomes, rear loads, front loads on 50s, and front loads on 60s and 70s. Two builders. Mm -hmm. So those agents, very happy. I bet. Um, And we have probably 180 lots left to go there. So, So we need to find replacements mm-hmm. for that because we've been living off of that deal for a long time wow yeah, yeah. in in wrapping up um jeff what's the team focused on now just in general you can answer that however you'd like but also can you provide an overview of uh what active communities i know we <coughs> talked about o'neill but i, I think uh fox bank or, or if there's anything else active you wanted to fox go bank. over in fact fox bank is in its last phase you know, <clears throat> last phase uh and we, and the commercial that we're doing is neighborhood commercial um it's it's a daycare um it's a local tenant as opposed to a big national tenant um and that is a an evolving um product for us we used to just sell off all the commercial to commercial. who owns the commercial now do you guys we do oh. in a separate entity uh, different kind of um you know Structure. more long-term mm-hmm. wealth um have several projects down in Charleston that are Homes of Hope projects um, here in Greenville, O'Neill. Uh, we're getting ready to start the uh, second phase of Pendleton West, uh, which is the mixed use. Um, we have project uh, south of town um, near Woodmont, Woodruff, excuse me, Woodmont High School. Mm-hmm. Three, four projects in the Traveler's Rest area, uh, Pinestone, mm-hmm. um, Penrose, which is not started, we just uh, finalized a deal, or in the process of finalizing a deal with uh, the school district for part of the property to be a middle school. They came to us and said, hey, oh, wow. we need part of your property for middle school. I'm like, okay. Um, but that'll be good for us, good for the community. Um, two other projects uh, in Travis Rest that are in the engineering design stage right now one the same family that we're working for before at Pinestone and another one uh, a group out of um, that were at the at presently they were from 
uh, the north, transitioning their company here and needed local help. They saw what we were doing at Pinestone and hired us uh, to do that. Wow. And it'll be uh, multifamily, which we'll just do the land development on, and then there's townhomes. So we'll we'll bring a builder to the table on, on the townhomes. Interesting. So... Where where do you see the the future of the company? We chatted a little bit about it before, and then secondarily to that, is there any being primarily residential developer? Is there any product type? Maybe you see built to rent, which maybe might not be for you. But is there any product type, asset class, market, um, or I guess even service that you haven't been in business wise that you would like to to, to do? Um. <clears throat> I think product wise, another product I'd like to introduce into that, you know, mixing product on the street mm -hmm. is a um like a fourplex, eightplex. So it's a single it's a big house on the street. So every old neighborhood had the big house. A lot of times it was uh multiple tenants. Mm -hmm. Um so if and that would help on the affordable housing side is if we could and you could sell it. Yeah. Um so it'd be the design would be a four square architectural design. Walk in a door, you got two units downstairs, two units upstairs, or it could be four and four. Mm -hmm. um, one bedroom, two bedroom unit that you could rent. So you could own it. If yep. you're already now owning commercial, you could own this. Um, and you could scatter a couple in the neighborhoods. Um, it's easy to sell that to the municipalities because you're talking about middle mi missing middle housing. Mm. Um, you know, it's affordable housing, so you go into a planning office, they're going to like that. Yeah, it's an interesting product. Um, yeah, and um, but that who builds it, who owns it, how do you finance it? How do you sell it? The yeah. banks are like, oh, what are you? What are we doing? Um, but I think that's that's a product that we could uh, that would fit well into our our mix. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but we're close on a couple deals. Uh, the one in uh, Travis Rest. Wow, that'll be that'll be interesting to see. W what's the future of the company? What's next for you, or what's next for, for the for the company as a whole? If you want to, um, anything so pertinent, so to speak. Um, uh, transitioning the company to a young man, Daniel Spivey, who was a student of mine at Clemson, wanted to be in the business, and none of my kids are coming back uh, to take over the business. And in this business, if you don't replace it, you just Lose it. sell the last lot and turn the lights off. Um, so I'm I'm trying to transition uh, the existing business to him, but help him find some new deals. Uh, still allows me to participate in whatever I want to. Um, I spend most of my time, and it's another block of business that I'm trying to cultivate, is just providing, I guess, um, due diligence, acquisition, consulting. I'm working for a church now that wants to dispose of 50-some uh, acres here in Greenville, and I'm just helping them with the disposition. I'm not really acting as a broker because uh, I'm a broker, but that's not what I do. But um, they need to be smart. Um, so, And that's... That's good work for me. Um, it's fun. Yeah. Um, trying to find some new deals. Um, still have the whole block of business for Homes of Hope, and we have probably 15 projects that we're working on, multiple sizes. Um, all affordable, which is it's a passion of mine, um, and I enjoy that. There's Providing a house for someone that's it's their very first house. It's an affordable house. A lot more sense of enjoyment than for sale. Selling a four hundred thousand dollar product, you right. know, and that person, you know, it's their third house, and they're probably over entitled. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, so, last question for you, Jeff. Who, who, who along the way in your career, elaborate career, um, helped you the most? Do you think, or who, who are different individuals, or? Again, answer it however you'd like, but who was impactful in in your career? I think of um, the leadership at Liberty Corp who um, taught me the value of um, quality, um, not chasing everything for money. You know, you have to make money and friends. Mm -hmm. And um, But you can do quality development and still make money. Um, so I think of 
Francis Hip and some of that leadership, and I'd be able to sit under those those guys. Um, consultants that have worked for me that have challenged me to make what we do better. Uh, Mike Taylor at DP3 Architects, uh, slightly older than me, he's now retired, started his company, and I can just remember him. And, and they they did an awful lot of design work on any community buildings, clubhouses, pavilions, whatever. But he had a good sense for residential land development. And he would just always say, I, I think you can do better. So he would make our ideas better. Um, Stuart Whiteside, uh, Stuart Whiteside's, again, slightly older, same kind of principle. I think we can do better. You know, yeah, this works, but I think there's something else. So just always pushing us to, to challenge myself. Um, today, Don Oglesby, who's um, um, founder at Homes of Hope, um, grounds me, a uh, good friend, uh, but also, you know, hey, let's don't forget about the rest of the people here that we need to, that don't have the resources. You know, what can we do? And he's open to some of those ideas. And, um, but he keeps me grounded. And then um, my wife, Carol, um, just keeping me grounded, making sure that, hey, we don't have to, we don't have to chase every deal. We don't have to, you can leave money on the table. Money's not, not critical. You know, we got, we got plenty, you know, and uh, so I could not, um, couldn't have done it without her either. I love it. I think that's a, a great place to, to wrap, Jeff. Was there any part of TRG overall or any, any bit that we, that we missed in wrapping up? No, I mean, there's a whole nother story. You know, I'm, I'm passionate about affordable housing. I, I'm fascinated yeah. working in those worlds. Uh, and it's even more difficult. So all the complications like is even harder in the affordable housing business. Um, just the red tape. What does it mean, affordable housing? You know, quickly people go to subsidized housing mm-hmm. and they don't understand that. Um, so I'm fascinated by that. But that's a whole nother, whole nother story. Whole nother episode. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm uh, very grateful that you would think that we're worthy of talking to you. Absolutely. Certainly are.